Hello, Richard, Edlin, this is so amazing. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> this is so cool. I also wanted to introduce Lior Molcho, who is a filmmaker and a uh, special effects enthusiast as well, and a big fan, so he can get into some of the more technical things that uh, I don't necessarily know about. Um, but, okay. you know. It's an honor, sir. I I'm very excited to, to be speaking with you. Oh, well, you're welcome. <laughs> well, you obviously have done some amazing things in your, you know, uh, decades long career and I feel like you've changed the history of the movie industry um, because of your innovations and even I know that and I'm not even a special effects you know techie but obviously one of the biggest films that people all, all over this world know and love was you know the Star Wars the initial Star Wars series that you were a part of and there's so many more movies that you've done since then but I just kind of wanted to get give everyone a feel for who you are the man, the, the magician behind the camera, making us all feel like we are there in space, flying through and fighting with the fighter jets and everything. Um, and just sort of get a feel for who you are and what made you decide to get into that side of the, the movie industry. Well, you know, everyone is a product of everything that's happened to him up to that moment uh, that's, that's had the opportunity that I got. And, <clears throat> and because I... Um, I was in the right place at the right time with the right capabilities. I uh, I lucked out and wound up, uh, you know, participating with in, in what's almost become a religion, Star Wars. <laughs> I got a call from John Dykstra one day when I was at Abel's, and John, Bob Abel was a commercial producer <clears throat> that that uh, my friend Richard Taylor and I. Uh, came into his studio and, and invented uh, what was called then a candy apple neon, which was like, it was sort of like a product of our hippie days and reminiscent of maybe an LSD trip. But anyway, it was, it was um, motion control that we were doing um, was done on, on punch tape, which is very crude. Um, and I knew John Dykstra because I, I knew that he had worked on some shows with Bob, with uh, Doug Trumbull. And, uh, and so one day I got a call from John. He said, Richard, you said, I heard, I heard about you and, and I would like you to come out and talk to me about shooting miniatures for this, this um, sci-fi movie that I'm going to be working on called Star Wars. And it's, it's produced by 20th Century Fox. And I immediately jumped in my Volkswagen and, and sped out there to the valley. And uh, <laughs> and actually, John was there with, with Gary Kurtz, who was the producer of, of Star Wars. And he was a gearhead. And, and the thing is that Gary Kurtz doesn't get the credit that he, sh that he should have gotten for the visual effects because he supported us um, in building this contraption that we designed in order to uh, to produce the kind of shots that George wanted to have in, in the movie. And essentially, I sat down with John and Gary and, and we talked, and about 20 minutes later, I had the job. And so I wound up as the director of photography for the miniatures and, and kind of like co-supervising the show with John. And uh, wow. designing the, the new uh, equipment that, that we had to, had to build in order to do this. And, and the, the thing that a lot of people don't realize is that, that that it was nine months. It took us nine months to build this system. And and Jim Nelson, who was a production manager, uh, used to really give us a lot, give us hell all the time because you guys are spending all this money and I haven't seen any film yet. You know, get hot, get with it. You know? <laughs> and so... It's so all, the, that's all the pre production and all of the planning and everything that goes into it that they're not necessarily like they're not understanding all of that, but obviously it came out to be worth it in the end. <laughs> right. And the thing is that, that I mean, first of all, American Graffiti was really a, a success. And, and, I, and George is, was, you know, very proud, very uh, capable director. And uh, I thought the, the script was really, 
it was very good and exciting, but I, I thought it was kind of a teenage script because I was worried about trust in the force loop and, and lines like that. I mean, who's going to pull those lines off? You know, I'm thinking Brando, you know, I mean, you know, you have to have someone with real gravitas that, that can that can deliver those kind of lines and not be, not sound foolish. And so we went ahead and we started building the system and about three or about, about three months after we started. And the coffee machine was always kind of like the center of, of communication. <laughs> we all met, met at the coffee, you know, because coffee was like a, it's like a drug kind of yeah. you know, it, <laughs> it, it the cranks you up and, and yeah. you know i wouldn't allow any decaf on my sets and we're going to take a quick break but we will be right back with richard edland on the red booth show and welcome back to the red booth show i'm kimberly q we're here with richard edland and also my co-host the your mole show one day jim nelson announced that john that george had cast alec guinness to play obi-wan kenobi and i thought this is that's it, you know. This is going to be a blockbuster because I, I really felt that it was going to be a big movie all along. So we started shooting, we started shooting, and we built this very com complicated system that enabled us to shoot miniatures that were moving, and the camera that was moving, and 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 the the, the, the filmic result of that. The contraption that we built was to was to make it seem like the shots that we were doing were shot by some guy with an Aeroflex. So everybody knows out there, motion control is the uh, technology that we have of holding a camera and having it move through a shot, which has gotten very advanced nowadays. But you know that's what he's that's what he was using to create these scenes. Right, and the thing is that if the camera didn't move and the models didn't move. They wouldn't have the kind, of, the same kind of motion blur that would exact, that would occur in normal photography that everyone's used to seeing. And in fact, if it's not there, it looks it looks like it, it, it stutters. That was the key to our our our, uh, our trick, and it required this this contraption I call it because it was like a great big boom, and it had a it had a a, a head on it. It looked like a Trojan helmet because the because the thing is that the the, the the lens had to move on the nodal point. You're mimicking a, a, a miniature camera, and so we had to build this very elaborate system from scratch. Um, Richard, uh, can I ask you a little bit about your how your background came into play? Because you mentioned the the different disciplines, which I think it's something that was very unique to the time where people came from different backgrounds to create movies. Invented a lot of stuff, but I, 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 I'm sort of an engineer, but I'm an engineer by discovery and experimentation and reading. I don't really have an, a, a, a formal education in engineering. I, at one point in the Navy, I took a course where we went from polynomials to calculus in six weeks, and we had to learn all the physical laws and we had to learn how to type 25 words a minute and we had to learn all of the nomenclature of the, of the ships and airplanes it was a, it was an amazing uh, uh like it was almost like educational pate where they were like pounding it down your throat you know but it was but it stuck and and that was a, a, a very valuable educational experience but beer before that when i was in, in the eighth and seventh and eighth grade in minneapolis i took electric shops, print shop, um, even boy bachelors. I learned, I mean, I, I learned how to, to bake a cake from scratch and, and operate a sewing machine. I mean, the, 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 those kind of classes are not available anymore. Well, you can take a quick break and we'll be right back with the Red Booth Show. Well, welcome back to the Red Booth Show. We're here with Richard Edland, um, a cinematography genius, special effects master, of the ages, and we were just talking about the story of how he got involved with Star Wars, and also a bit about your childhood, learning some of the skills that I think helped, ended up culminating to to everything you've been able to invent since then. So I'm a generalist, you know. I understand. I, I had a great photographic teacher in high school who taught me the physics of photography, 
he taught me. He was a physics teacher. He was a super nerd. If you don't mind, I have another question about Star Wars because Kimberly and I were discussing before the, the show about how, why does it look so much better than CG movies? And there are a lot of reasons. Why does the original Star Wars still look better and more real than current CGI movies? And I was talking about the shot design and I wonder if you can talk a little bit because you touched about how like it's a camera in space moving around. And if you look at Star Wars, especially the first one, the, the, the shots are a few frames long. It, it, it's almost abstract filmmaking. First of all, the models were very small. The X-Wing was about, about, not a foot and a half, like 16 inches long. And in order to get the dynamics of the, of the shots, I had to make sure that I could get very close to the, to the, to the models. And, and so we, we had this format called Distribution which is pulls the cam, it pulls the film sideways through the movement as opposed to from top to bottom. And so that makes the, makes the profile of the camera horizontally more, more friendly to getting real close to, to, to surfaces, physically tilt the lens so that I could, I could enhance the focus point. All these shots where you have the model going right by the camera, I had to call the model shop to fix the model often because I bump into it. And were you guys figuring this out sort of as you went? Like it, it sounds... We had, yeah, we figured it out. And, and this, it, a lot of this was in that initial discussion I had with John. I mean, you know, we discovered, we immediately agreed that we had to move the camera in the model. And the motion control system that we had was also repeatable. And also at like, at like less than a 24th of speed. So the, actually I'm thinking, in, I'm thinking in slow motion when I'm, de- when I'm de- programming the shots. So it's like sped up in cam- afterwards, after you shoot it? Well, yeah, because in other words, I'm, I'm shooting a shot that's maybe, because a lot of these shots were like 24, 30 frames long. And, and so it takes like three or four minutes to shoot that, that, that scene. That, plus the fact that if we were shooting these guys flying at hundreds of miles an hour, each shot would have lasted two frames. We could cheat like that because it looked great, and, and that was the that was the model. That was the key. So the key is make it look great. I mean, I, I obviously love old movies and the old styles, but these all of the lighting is such a huge factor in filmmaking, and the feel, the look and feel of the movie really is dependent so much upon the lighting. And right. I think that's part of why your sets and your models looked so realistic was because of the way you were lighting them. And I also wanted to mention that Lior has a little surprise. Uh, I think you should tell him about some something there. Um, so um, years ago, I, I'm sure you know, there was the Kerner optical fire sale. Um, so I have the one of the Empire motion control rigs in my garage. Oh, you did? Yeah. He has it right now, yeah. Trying to get it to work again. Uh, you, have, you know, you're running you Windows have 95. The, mm-hmm. You have one of the actual ones that you bought at auction? <laughs> I actually, I inherited it from a guy who bought it in auction, never used it, and was about to go, you know, be thrown away. And it was interesting because uh, I, it was in one of the studios here, not, never mind who. And they were telling me, why are you taking it? Because I had to get, you know, like a flatbed, you know, it's a ton and a half. And I had to get like a flatbed and everything. They're like, why are you doing this? You know, you can rent a motion control rig if you want to film something. And I said, you know what? When, when Edlund made Star Wars, he found all the old Vista Vision equipment that nobody wanted. So I'm keeping this because I think, it, I think it's worth something, you know? Well, it is. Uh, and and let, let me tell you that, that at the Academy, we have a, a project right at the moment to resurrect the, mo- the Star Wars motion control system. And so we've resurrected oh. the boom and the camera and the, and the, and the, yeah. the, the, yeah, the head yeah. that I was mentioning. But we don't have a model movement. Hey, you know what? So we need to talk to you about that. And maybe <laughs> if we can't get it from you, we can at least be able to copy it. And welcome back to the Red Booth Show. I'm Kimberly Q. We're here with Richard Edlin and also my co-host, Lior Molcho. 
because I mean, the opening shot of Star Wars was 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 this thing that was that came up considerably, and George would come down occasionally because I, I basically could communicate with George with this grid with this grid system I designed, and it had a twenty two field grid, and so there's twenty and so it's like you could position things x y and z axis north south east west you know by using this grid system and i had made one up george's size for his for his uh, flatbed editor that he was using up in marin because he was cutting the movie up and he, when he would come down he would say Emperor skywalker oh. ran ranches right i think that's the same area yeah there. right well then he, he, later he bought he had when all the money came he bought that whatever anyway and so I had Grant, the, the head of the model shop, put his best guy on detailing the bottom of this four foot long star destroyer. And so basically he tricked out the bottom of it. I shot it upside down. I put it down upside down and I programmed the camera to, to skim the surface of it. I tilted the lens in order to put, be able to hold focus all the way down there. I did a test. And the next day everybody was flummoxed. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, it worked. And the thing is, I knew that that was going to be the most important shot that we could do. Because if the audience was not on board with that shot, the movie might not have worked. And I mean, I obviously have other movies I want to talk to you about as well, but just to wrap it up really quick on Star Wars, what was it like when you, when it came out and the whole world oh, God. fell in love? So I come into the, Chinese theater for like the opening show, the opening screening after the party. There was a party at, at some, and all of us showed up at this party. And we go to the Chinese theater for the screening, and all of a sudden you hear, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like you hear the sound, you mean you hear the, 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 uh, the theme song of the movie. And all of a sudden, this this huge model comes endlessly over the camera, and and the audience is 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 enwrapped by this. I mean, they're just you know, and we're the audience. I mean, we were like, I mean, because we would seen it, you know, with scratches and all that. Old, and and so basically, to see it finished in a seventy millimeter blow up print with the six track stereo. And I mean, George wouldn't, unless the theater uh, put in a Dolby system, he wouldn't show the movie. Wow. So he forced theaters to put in a, a high quality sound system. But, but anyway, it was, it was, uh, it was mind blowing. So cool. <laughs> and then also, I mean, you were worked on the Indiana Jones, you know, and there was a really cool story that I kind of heard about that. Well, I did. I did Raiders of the Lost Ark, and that was that was the first one, and and, and, I, and basically, I, then I did Poltergeist after that. That's right. Now there's a fun. And then Return of the story. Jedi. And so I did five movies at Lucasfilm. I did Star Wars, Empire, Raiders, Poltergeist, and and Return of the Jedi. And at, at the end of that, I I felt you know I kind of like to branch out on my own, and I left ILM. Oh, see, and that was a huge hit too. Everyone yeah. loves Ghostbusters. That's like, I know they're doing new new Ghostbusters now, but I mean, it was right. so awesome when it came out. Just essentially, you created the look of ghosts because you did Raiders and Poltergeist and Ghostbusters. So ever since then, every ghost that's being made is kind of like has the same photographic quality. They're trying to recreate that look. Uh, Poltergeist, because Poltergeist was kind of really my coming out movie, because I had done Star Wars and Empire and Jedi fantasy movies, and then I did Raiders, which is like semi-fantasy, because you have the Wrath of God and the Nazis and all that, and and then but Poltergeist was like like your neighbor's house. It was happening in your neighbor's house. And that so, steered the bejesus out of the whole world. Yeah, I mean, in other words, it's happening, <laughs> in, it's happening in your time. And, and it, you know, you don't have to think about, you know, it's in the 30s. Yeah, I people mean, were wondering if, they were, if their house was built on a burial site after that movie. Like, you know, that was... 
what what advice do you have for people who would like to get into special effects? And if you're if you're if you're talented and if you have uh, confidence in yourself and you're willing to be persistent because it's not easy to jump in, understand that it's going to be tough because it's a tough business. And the thing is that there's a lot of incredibly talented young people that are coming into the visual effects business. And the thing is that these movies that are being made now, these Marvel movies that, that have 2,000 shots, you know, I mean, it's not like Star Wars. I mean, Star Wars, we did just between us. I did Star Wars with about 80 or 90 people over two years for two and a half million dollars. Amazing. And now... The budgets are hundreds of millions if it's a camera. For visual effects, I'm talking about. Right. So, I mean, it, and, and they have, they don't have 80 or 90 people, and that's not all at the same time, too, by the way. I mean, Obviously, we're, our technology is always evolving, and as long as you have the creativity, then, which obviously you do, the genius to figure things out. Well, you're such an inspiration. I'm so excited that we got to have you on the show and, and talk to you about all of your experiences and Lior. Some, some of my experiences. Yeah, that's true. Just I didn't get in my rock and roll era. Man, we'll have to do a part two. <laughs> we'll have to come back and do some more because I'm out of time, but I love hearing your stories and I think you're very inspiring. And I know Lior also, if you have anything you want to ask before we close off, please feel free. Well, I can't say um, that Harvard at all, so I could. Yeah, I, I have like uh, all the questions. <laughs> I don't all know what it would be that I would add. There's a lot of things. <laughs> I just am so happy that we got to talk to you. And of course, right. we could do some more. Uh, someday, hopefully, we'll do another. But I just really appreciate you being on the show. And uh, thank you also to Lior Mocho for being my co host today and talking with you as well. All right. Thank you, Richard. Thank Our you. Pleasure. All right. Good day. Good day, and we'll, we'll, look, we'll look out for your new show with uh, JFK as well. Yeah, right. It's called Deception. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for watching Richard Edlund on the Red Booth Show and also the Warmo Show with my co-host. Thank you.